This fourth lecture, titled Late Ming Albums, Early Orthodox, Xiaomi, uh, my original intention was to devote this fourth lecture in the Gazing into the Past series uh, to an album in the Seattle Art Museum by this late Ming artist, Xiaomi. Uh, but although that's still going to be the main topic of the latter part of this lecture, uh, the first part will be about the Orthodox school of landscape in the late Ming and early Qing periods, uh, that is the, well, 16th, 17th century, and especially the albums of landscapes that the um, Orthodox masters produced in this time. In the previous lectures on Huang Gung Wang uh, and in numbers of earlier lectures, I kept referring to the Orthodox school landscape and the Orthodox painters in the Ming Qing period without really stopping to show their works or discuss them in any, any real depth. And in that last lecture, I showed a single leaf by Wang Jian, dated 1666, uh, early in the Qing Dynasty, which begins in 1634. Well, this time I'll show the entire album, among other things, and discuss, as I say, the uh, beginnings of Orthodox school landscape in China before going on to this wonderful album by Xiaomi. Here to begin with are four fan-shaped album leaves, ink and colors on silk, that Dong Xi Chang painted in 1596, very early in his long career as a painter. They were shown in the great Dong Xi Chang exhibition of 1992 that Wai Gam Ho organized. I will later have a whole lecture on Dong Xi Chang and his works, in which I'll talk more about that exhibition and its symposium. The leaves of the album can scarcely be said to be in any style. Dong Xi Chang is trying to copy these styles of old masters much more closely than he was to do later. Next, please. Two of the leaves closer up. The one at left is in the style of Mi Fu. A leaf attributed to him that was in the Chinese Art Treasures exhibition is quite similar and is probably Dung's model. The one at right is probably meant to be in the style of Zhao Lingrong, and we can recognize similarities to the hand scroll by him dated 1100 in the Boston Museum of Fine Arts, which I showed at length in one lecture. Neither of them reveals any attempt to turn the old styles to new purpose, as Dung was to do later. Next, please. This comparison, a detail at right from a painting Dung Chi did in 1620, beside a section of a scroll that Dung believed to be by Wang Wei, appears on page 52 of my compelling image book as part of an effort that I make there and also in uh, my uh, chapter on Dung Chi Chang in the Distant Mountains book to define and elucidate just how Dung's practice of fang or creative imitation really worked. These two chapters make up, so far as I know, the only serious attempt to deal with the actual practice of Fang, an attempt that necessarily uses a visual approach that others have been reluctant or unable to adopt. So I recommend you read those chapters if you are seriously interested in this practice, practice of creative imitation, as I call it. Next. An important document in understanding this practice of Fang is an album of reduced-sized copies of old paintings titled Xiaozhong Shen Da, or The Great Revealed and the Small. You'll find a discussion of this album on pages 173 to 74 of my Distant Mountains book. The old paintings that are copied in it were owned by Dong Ji Chang's younger disciple, Wang Shermin, who was the youngest of the so-called Four Wangs, who were the principal figures in the early development of the Orthodox School of Landscape. Inscriptions by Dong Ji Chang on the facing pages, as you see. This is one of the leaves copying a landscape by Huang Gung Wang. If you watch the previous lecture, you'll recognize immediately uh, what elements of Huang Gung Wang's style are in it. Next, please. Another double leaf from this album. Wang Shermin, a rich young man, owned the original paintings that were copied for this album, and Dong Xi Chang wrote inscriptions on the opposing leaves for them, for him. Uh, the album is in the National Palace Museum in Taipei. The original painting, this time, was a landscape by Huang Gong Wang, copied after one by Dong Yuan. These two artists became the, among the principal forefathers of Orthodox school landscape and of the so-called Southern School, 
a pseudo-art historical formulation that Dung Chi Chang devised as a basis for the kind of painting that he and his followers did. Uh, the Southern School was made up of the uh, scholar amateur and other artists that they admired and took as their forebears. The Northern School, the despised uh, Huat Academy and professional artists. They say it's a pseudo-art historical formulation. Next, please. Still a third double leaf from this album, with a facing inscription by Dung, written in 1616. The landscape again appears to be after Huang Gong Wang, or perhaps it's intended as a copy after Dung Yuan. Seldom has a school or manner of painting been given such an authoritative and prescriptive basis. It was to persist without serious challenge down into the 20th century as the, quote, right way for scholar-amateur artists to paint landscape. Uh, you can read the beginning of the first chapter of my Pictures for Use and Pleasure book for another discussion of it. Next, please. I don't have any. I don't have images of any Wang Shermin album in old styles, but here to represent him is a landscape that he painted in 1660 in the Shanghai Museum. Wang Shermin is probably the least gifted of the four Wangs as a painter, but he serves as a consolidator of the style. Uh, his hanging scroll landscapes are often like this one, crowded with detail, as if he suffered from the misguided belief that in composing a picture, more is better. It's obviously still in the manner of Huang Gong Wang. Next, please. I do have good slides, however, of a 12-leaf album by his slightly younger friend Wang Jian, no relation, who is an altogether better painter. I should point out that the draft chapter on early Orthodox school painting for the projected fourth book in my series, which was to be on early Qing painting, and was never completed and published, should be on my website, and it soon will be. You can read there in the first chapter about all the matters I'm talking about now. Um, this 12-leaf album, painted by Wang Jen in 1666, was once my own. I acquired it in a trade from C.C. C. Wang. This is the first leaf, obviously in the Huang Gong Wang manner. Next, please. The second leaf, not inscribed as being after any particular old master, there are clearly elements of Huang Gong Wang's style in it, but others associated with the Zhao Meng Fu and others. Next, please. Third leaf. Inscribed as in the manner of Hui Chong. Hui Chong, as you may remember, was an early Song master who painted typically river scenes with waterfowl. He was taken up by the late Northern Song literati artists as one of their predecessors because they considered his painting to be poetic. Next, please. Fourth leaf. Inscribed as in the manner of Zhang Guandao, or Zhang Shun, active in the early 12th century, and taken into their list of respected predecessors by the literati artists because he followed Dungran and Juran, the approved models. His own works are rather dull. His name is used for paintings loosely in a sung manner. Next, leaf. Next please. The fifth leaf, another with no old master named in its inscription, but typical of Wang Zhen's style. The next, the sixth leaf in the manner of Shu Ming, or Wang Meng. It won't be easy to discern the Wang Meng style in this. The really stimulating features of Wang Meng's paintings are not used by the orthodox masters, who scrupulously avoided the visually stimulating. Next, please. Seventh leaf inscribed as in the manner of Zhao Lingrong. No problem seeing the visual references here. Next, please. The eighth leaf another in the Huang Gong Wang manner. This is the leaf I showed in the previous lecture on Huang Gong Wang. Next. Ninth leaf, again inscribed as being after Hui Chong and naming a particular work by him, Spring in Zhongnan, Zhongnan Chun. Uh, with no works by Hui Chong to see, we have no way of knowing what underlies such a painting. Next. The tenth leaf, inscribed with a couplet, two seven character lines, no mention of an old master, and a more complex composition than was common in Wang Zhen's works. I was sorry to part with this album, but I needed the money. Next. The eleventh leaf, manner of Zhao Meng Fu, who seems to have worked in a colored manner that underlies paintings of this kind with green hills and richly colored trees. Uh, we don't seem to have any extant paintings by Zhao Meng Fu in this manner, but we know about it from copies and imitations like this one. Next, please. 
The twelfth and last leaf, another in the manner of Wang Meng, also giving the cyclical date in the inscription, which, as I say, corresponds to 1666. So much for this, a better than average example of the common orthodox school practice of painting landscape albums in a succession of old styles. Next, please. Finally, for orthodox landscape in this lecture, let me point out that it continues to be the absolute foundation of literati painting practice and connoisseurship down into the 20th century. In the 1930s, the highest level of connoisseurship and collecting was represented by the great collector connoisseur Wu Hu Fan and his disciples in Shanghai. He's the subject of a fine book by Clarissa von Spey titled Wu Hu Fan, a 20th century art connoisseur in Shanghai, Berlin 2008. Here's a photo of Wu Hu Fan from her book. Born in 1924, he died in 1968, before I could go to China, so I never knew him, except by reputation. Next, please. I did, however, have the privilege of knowing his two leading disciples, Wang Zhichen, or Sisi Wang, and Xu Bang Da, the former long and especially closely. The point I want to make about Wu Hu Fan and his group is that the appreciation and practice of the orthodox mode of landscape painting remain central to these leading figures in Chinese painting connoisseurship of recent times. And it underlies the central belief, which I've cited many times uh, in the words of C.C. C. Wong, that the highest level of connoisseurship pays little or no attention to the painting as a picture, since orthodox school landscape is endlessly repetitive and subject. One looks instead at the brushwork, the hand of the artist, the facture, or the making of the painting. Exactly the aspect of it that I stressed in talking about Huang Gong Wang's painting in the previous lecture. In his hands, or his hand, however, it was visually exciting, but in the hands of the later orthodox school masters it becomes monotonous, at least for me. But that, they insist, is exactly what is admirable, admirable about it. It's supposed to be monotonous. Aug. Next. The early paintings of C.C. Wong, of which this is an example, are in the orthodox landscape manner. Actually here, the manner of Wu Jun rather than Huang Gong Wang. And an appreciation of this whole lineage of painting remained central to Wang's teaching, as I well remember. Next. Even Victoria Kontag, who was a kind of foreign member of the group during her time in Shanghai in the 1930s, absorbed the doctrine so thoroughly that, although she was never herself a painter, she wrote with deep understanding, perhaps unparalleled in her time among non-Chinese scholars, about orthodox school landscape painting, as in her 1955 book, Zwei Meister Chinesischer Landschaft Malerei, uh, Two Masters of Chinese Landscape Painting, about Wang Hui and Wang Ranxi, as I recall, as well as in her Chinese Paintings of the 17th Century, and an important lecture article that I cited in the 12th and last lecture in the Pure and Remote View series. And the huge effect of these and other Chinese scholars and writers on Chinese painting has been to establish this orthodox doctrine as if it were a central truth about our subject, instead of what it is, the dogmatic belief of a male elite minority within Chinese painting, as I argue in my recent book. But enough about orthodoxy and later Chinese painting. Now back to the late Ming to look at the more attractive alternatives, especially at one of them, the album by Xiaomi. Next. <clears throat> I myself, as many of you know, although I learned this doctrine early on from C. C. Wong and others, have devoted a large part of my long career to trying to shift attention toward the neglected alternatives. For the late Ming, Suzhou school paintings such as Li Shi Da's Gazing out, from a, Gazing out from a Pavilion in the Mountains of 1615, reproduced as the first color plate in distant mountains, or Zhang Hong's Jur Garden album of 1627. I'll be devoting an entire later lecture to that great album. Next, please. And I'll have another lecture on Chinese paintings of gardens, showing some from the late Ming, such as this album of scenes from the Jiao Garden, the Garden of Wang Shermin, painted by the Sungjong master Shun Zhu Chung. All this is for the future. Next. Another interesting album type produced in this period, and one discussed at length in my Lyric Journey book, 
is the album of leaves illustrating lines of poetry, usually from old poems well known to viewers of the time. An artist who specialized in these and produced several fine examples is Shang Mao Ye, or Shang Mao Hua. This is a leaf from his excellent album in the, there's two leaves that is, uh, excellent album in the Asian Art Museum, San Francisco. Two leaves from it are reproduced on page 124 of the Lyric Journey and are discussed in the text there. Next, uh, please. Uh, these same two leaves are reproduced in color in the Chinese edition of The Distant Mountains which contains a lot more color than the original English language version did. The couplet on this leaf can be translated, the water is cold and stones are seen deep down. The pines are dusky and wind sounds in the quiet. But all that belongs to a different lecture, which I may put together sometime in the future. For now and for the remainder of this lecture, on to Xiaomi's album. Next. So, if I'm going to talk about Xiaomi's albums, what are these two photos doing on screen? The answer, of course, is that, as usual in my late life lectures, I can scarcely talk about any important painting without stopping to relate my personal involvement with it. The photo at left is of Avery Brundage, the donor of the collection that formed the basis of the Asian Art Museum of San Francisco. For my feelings about him, go to my website, pull down the Responses and Reminiscences series, and read number 54, called Two Famous Collector Donors I Didn't Like. Avery Brundage, whom I knew too well, was one of them, and Arthur M. Sackler, Jr., whom I knew less well, was the other. The photo at right is of Yvonne Dargenotse, for many years the curator of Brundage's collection, and Brundage's favorite scholar, whom he referred to as, quote, the son I never had, although in fact he did have a real son, unacknowledged, living not far from San Francisco with his mother, who was Brundage's mistress. Uh, all of another story. I'll have a lecture in a separate series titled something like Good Guys and Bad Guys about people who have played those roles in my life. Yvonne D'Argence will be featured prominently there as one of the very few bad guys and I'll explain in detail why he is there. Next, please. I had known the Xiaomi album from the time it was owned by the dealer and my good friend, Jean-Pierre Dubosc, and had included leaves from it in the Restless Landscape Exhibition of Late Ming Painting that I organized with my famous seminar of eight young women scholars. So I was very familiar with the album and was eager to see it come to the Asian Art Museum. After the Brundage Symposium of 1966, some money was left over from the sum raised for the symposium, and a committee was formed with both Yvonne and Dargenotse and myself on it to decide how to spend it. I strongly advised and argued that we should purchase this album, still owned by Dubois, for the Asian Art Museum. But Yvonne, who always as a matter of principle opposed whatever I proposed, blocked the purchase making his favorite argument about condition, his lack of any art historical training and any eye for quality, made that an imperative for him, the only kind of argument he could make, really. He said that the leaves were badly mounted, they had a lot of repainting and so on. None of this was true, but it effectively killed off the purchase. The album was purchased instead shortly afterward by Henry Trubner for the Seattle Art Museum, where it's been ever since. Last year, Josh Yu, a young curator there who began his career as a Chinese art specialist when he sat in on a course that I gave at the University of Chicago. Josh Yu asked me to write an essay on this album and its leaves for a new catalog he was preparing on their Chinese painting holdings. I agreed and the essay I wrote will form the basis for the remainder of this lecture. It's been published online along with the rest of the catalog by Josh Yu. Next please. <coughs> But no, still more delay in seeing the album when I talk a bit about the artist. On screen now is a brief note on the artist's life that appears on an additional leaf in the Seattle album. The best biography of Xiaomi in English, perhaps in any language, is the one written by Ellen Lang for the Dictionary of Ming Biography. His birth and death dates are unknown, but his period of activity 
as judged from extant dated works, is from the 1620s to the 1640s, and he probably died around 1660. Born into a gentry family, his father was a physician. He was a learned and cultivated man, but ill health from childhood precluded any attempt at an official career. He must have had some steady income, perhaps some inherited property, and he appears to have lived comfortably enough collecting paintings and antiquities. A colleague describes him as being, quote, as thin as a yellow crane and as free as a seagull. He was seriously afflicted from middle age with a lung disease and read widely in medical books in search of a cure, but without success. His situation in late Ming painting history was ambivalent. On one hand, he was a native of Suzhou and an heir to its great tradition of painting and one who admired and imitated Tong Yin and Wen Zheng Ming. On the other hand, he was a literatus with close ties to the rival movement in Xinjiang, led by Deng Zhichong and his followers. A selection of Xiaomi's works could be made to illustrate either tendency. Uh, next, uh, uh, next, please. An undated but presumably early album by Xiaomi in the National Palace Museum in Taipei includes leaves in the manners of his Suzhou forebears, such as Tang Yin. Two leaves seen here, copied from the Chinese edition of my Distant Mountains book. Others of the works for which I have no images, including an album of landscapes he painted in 1634, which contains an admiring colophon by Dong Chi Chang and a hand scroll from 1640, imitate Dong Chi Chang and other Xinjiang artists so closely that they might be taken for works by one of that group. These latter, Xiaomi's attempts to join the new movement in Xinjiang and paint like a proto-Orthodox artist, are for me his least interesting works, except that they illustrate this wrong direction that he might have taken. Instead, he became, for the most part, an independent master, as seen in the Seattle album that we're about to look at at long last. Next, please. An inscription written by Xiaomi himself on a leaf in the album that follows the paintings can be translated as follows, quote, To take the old masters as your teachers is certainly good, but in order to make further progress, um, it is necessary to take heaven and earth as teachers. I often return to the mountains and observe the changing clouds and mist in the mornings, and also the singular trees and springs. In gathering it all in the plain silk, I sometimes went forward and sometimes backward. Such are the pleasant diversions of hermits. I painted this album after drinking wine by lamplight. It is not worthy of viewing by people with awakened eyes. The painting leaves of this album, which as I said were done in 1638, reveal him uh, as an independent master, basically unaffected by these new orthodox developments in Sungjong among Dong Zhichang's in his circle able to invent and imagine freely. His rejection of the Xinjiang new orthodoxy was, in my view at least, his salvation as an artist of real originality. Next, please. And that, inventing and imagining freely, is exactly what we can observe him doing in the Seattle album, of which, seen at last, this is the first leaf. The order in which I'll show the leaves is that of the Seattle Art Museum. They are not numbered and they can be arranged in any order, provided only that the inscribed leaf is, is the last one. Also, I should say that the details were made by Josh Yu, not by myself. I would have made more and closer in details. Next, please. The couplet written by Xiaomi on the last leaf, seen here in the detail, reads, Divine realms where immortals are concealed, I once came in a dream upon these shores. Treatments of these leaves, including those by myself and my students, have offered compositional analyses that try to account for the unsettling effects they have on viewers. Instead of doing that familiar kind of reading again, seriously interested viewers can find those earlier accounts in books, I want to try another approach, one that is suggested by the couplet that Xiaomi inscribed on this last leaf. If these are dreamlike realms where immortals are concealed or dwelling, then are we to imagine visiting them, following pictorial clues that the artist has provided? Does the album offer escape from the mundane world, just as Xiaomi must have longed to escape his real, troubled existence? 
All the leaves contain some indicators of human habitation or human passage, cliffside paths with railings, steep ascents with stairs, buildings that are, at least to this viewer, often of an ambiguous character, houses, shrines, temples, and always the viewer is confronted and confounded with patterns that disrupt the simple re readings, evoking dreamlike effects, removing us from the firmly traversable and easily intelligible real world. Next. This detail shows better these elements in Xiaomi's first leaf. As you will remember from my earlier lectures, an important component in the construction of traditional landscape paintings in China, and one that guided the viewer's visual readings of them, was the inclusion in the picture of indications of human passage, paths with steps and railings, viewing pavilions where one was to imagine stopping to rest, buildings that could be rest read as starting points or destinations. Early landscapists took care to lay these out clearly, controlling to some degree the way their viewers read the pictures. In early monumental landscapes, for instance, as you remember, secular dwellings or villages of the bottom were connected by a path of road steps to a temple seen above, setting a theme of spiritual ascent with the inaccessible peak still further up. Nothing so simple and complete is seen in Xiaomi's first leaf. At first glance, it appears to present a visionary image of a double peak rising above clouds with no sign of human passage or habitation. In fact, it's only on close examination that one finds such indicators, and they are so slight, so ambiguous, that Xiaomi's intent still remains unclear. Ascending the right edge of the smaller peak at left is a streak of unpainted paper, more or less even in width, from similar passages in other leaves, and from a few horizontal strokes of ink quickly brushed across it, we know that it's intended as a path or as steps cut into the rock. Anyone who has ascended the Tian Lu Feng or Heavenly Citadel Peak at Huangshan is familiar with such a long ascent by rock-cut steps. Next, please. I have no good image of that, but here is one of a lower peak showing the stone steps ascending it. Next. And here is a photo made from near the top of the Tendu Feng, showing people ascending the stone steps or resting on a ledge before continuing. Next. Moreover, in Xiaomi's leaf, at the far end of the flat-topped ledge to the right, over a ravine, is a form one might at first read as a stone mass, but which proves on close examination to be a house the red roof with triangular end, the fence around it, the paving stones leading to it from the left, leave no doubt of the artist's intent. Are we then to imagine ourselves descending the stone stairway, somehow crossing the ravine, and visiting the house? This is a difficult reading of the painting, but one that seems in the end inescapable. So this is our first glimpse of what Xiaomi means by coming in a dream to divine realms where immortals dwell. Next. The second leaf harks back to a subject and compositional type well known in the paintings of Wen Zheng Ming. Next. Wen Zheng Ming's Jurping Temple painting of 1516 is one of many examples one could use. Even the row of tall pine trees in the foreground corresponds. And the two figures play out a familiar Wen Zheng Ming theme. One of them, the recluse, seen seated in his house through the open window, the other approaching on a visit. But Xiaomi disrupts this familiar pattern by tilting the scene, the right end, the right side upward, the left downward. The zigzag course of the foreground dike with pines is echoed by the retaining wall across the pond, with the architectural elements of the picture zigzagging more strongly to connect these two, front and back. Even this leaf, most conventional of the album in its subject, ends as unsettling. The next piece. This detail of the middle left section emphasizes the unstable, slanting character of the whole composition. Familiar ways of achieving space and depth, the repoussoir pines, the receding architecture, also disrupt any truly spatial reading of the picture. Next. Leaf 3 is another that is dominated by a sideward lunging rocky mass. Across from it to the left, a torii like gateway marks the starting point of our imagined passage through the picture. 
eventually to arrive at the prominent buildings in upper right. A descending path, a plateau with evenly spread marks, perhaps meant as stepping stones, leading to a stone bridge over a waterfall, more marks, and a steep descent. But there the clear indications of passage end, leaving us to make our difficult way across a deep valley and somehow up to where the stone steps reemerge, just below the plateau with buildings. What we see is presumably a residential compound where we can rest and commune with the occupant, one of the immortals of Shalmi's inscription. Next, please. The immortal's dwelling, seen up closer. Now we note that an easier access to the plateau on which it's built, a strip of flat blue coming over the mountaintop and downward, is also provided. But the horizontal markings on the ascent below the plateau are clearly intended as stone steps and meant to indicate the main way of reaching it. These visual ambiguities and multiple routes of access further remove the dream dwellings from simple real-world imagery. Next. In Leaf 4, both the impressive residential compound and the approach to it are clearly displayed. The residence is surrounded by knobby topped ridges, open only in the lower left where we are pulled abruptly into the foreground. Steps lead down from an opening in the ridge in upper right, bringing us close to the outer wall of the compound, where we find an open gate through which the noble scholar who lives there has ventured out. Next, please. Leaning on his staff, he stands beneath pines on the shore of a lake or stream. Near him is a stone marker or monument that must have carried some significance for the artist, but is mysterious to us, at least to me. The S-curve of the receding wall above echoes the shape of the ridge in upper left. Between them is a viewing pavilion seen above the pine trees, showing where the occupant and his guests can sit and gaze off at the further scenery. Next. Leaf 5 seems to depict, relatively openly, the approach to a residence. Most of the lower right area is occupied by water. Two areas of flat shoals, one up close beneath the gate and the other further down, suggest places where someone arriving by boat might come ashore. At the lower one, access to human habitation is indicated by a bridge, a fence, and two entrance gates. A path appears above, but with no clear indication of where it leads. A gap between boulders further up is filled with an unbroken wall. Next. The place where one presumably disembarks to approach the wall and gate. Why are there two entry, entry, entrance gates? one a short way above the other. More mystery. Other possible places of disembarkation with streaks that may be meant as roads appear at the left. Next. The wall at the top extending across the opening between land masses as seen in this detail has a large gate of its own through which one would pass to proceed through a grove of tall pine trees and arrive presumably at the dwelling of the immortal of this leaf. Actually, two potential approaches to the gate are shown, but they cross, forming an X, with one of them disappearing off the left edge. Ambiguity compounded with ambiguity. Do these immortals really want to be visited? Next, please. The sixth leaf is reminiscent of the first, but here the dynamism is played down as the leaf is dominated by a symmetrically disposed, frontally viewed, flat-topped monolith. A path leads in from lower left to ascend the cliff to a place that is reachable also by a long flight of stone steps coming down from a cleft above. Next. Here we see a detail of this. The path coming up ends ambiguously, not joining the other. But we have to understand that they do join. Throughout the leaves, we are left unsure about what is intentional ambiguity, what is carelessness. These are not to be taken as clear representations such an academy master would make, in which everything is spelled out. Next, please. From here, a broader path or road with a protective railing carries the eye laterally across the main cliff face. It passes behind another square top form to arrive at a plateau on which two buildings represent our destination, a shrine, a residence. But how could anyone live in such a place? We can only read the whole crypto-narrative structure as evoking once more a difficult passage through the divine realms of the artist's imagination. 
and even these are ambiguous. Is the cleft leading upward from near the buildings to another gap above meant as stone steps? There are no horizontal markings to show that it is. Chalmy wants these passages to be as unclear in the painting as they must have been in his mind. His hand and brush stop short of elucidating them. Next. Leach 7 offers less grander and less insistent traversals of the scene. Near the lower right corner, above a clearing and leafy trees, a man is seen in a house. Another path close to the right margin leads upward to a few houses. No clearly marked road carries the eye across the center of the composition. Next, please. But a road emerges left of the vertical mass to lead around the cliff to where a solitary figure, seen below tall pine trees, walks down the road, away from a gate seen high above. He may be coming to visit his friend, the man in the house. Beyond is one of the few distant views that these leaves provide. The next, please. In the scene presented by Leaf 8, we are again outside a residence, close to the wall made up of flat stones of irregular shape. The roof gate at the left seems to invite us in. Red leaves on one of the two large leafy trees outside the gate set the season as autumn. Next. But our attention is drawn instead to a striking form in lower right, a flat-topped rectangular mass of stone, I think it's stone, set on a slightly larger base. Is this the marker of a tomb or a burial? Again, a prominent form that is ambiguous and evocative upsets any conventional mundane reading of the picture. Someone else may recognize what this form is meant to represent. I can't. Next. The gateway in the lower left is ordinary enough and not drawn so as to draw our attention. Two tall trees grow in front of it, one wound with vines and with autumn foliage, the other with dark masses of leafage. Next. Seen in detail above, they prove to be elaborated on the surface without showing any structure and depth. Xiaomi is not the kind of artist who can provide that. We can only imagine what a rich, multi-layered experience another kind of artist would have made of this passage. Next, please. Leaf 9 is another of the striking grand-scale scenes that most impress, and one that has been most often reproduced and described. What's immediately unsettling about the composition is the way it all seems to funnel downward, like some unstable mass, into the lower left corner. Much of the lower right is hidden by fog, which drifts also across the ridge of hills at the top. The next. The main residence here, an impressive multi-story complex of buildings, is located on a flat area just below this. Lesser buildings are glimpsed through breaks in the fog at right. Depictions of large retirement residences in Chinese paintings of this kind, seen here, are often accompanied by clusters of smaller houses outside. Living in proximity to simpler folk is part of the reclusive ideal. How one reaches this immortal's dwelling is relatively clear. A broad road leads in from upper left, skirting the hills to arrive at a prominent structure located near the exact center of the picture, a gateway or maybe a covered bridge uh, beneath tall pine trees. There one can pause to gaze at the waterfall or make one's ascent by some path not marked but imagined up to the residence. Next please. Always, however, the bottomless gorge into which the waterfall drops seems to pull at one's attention and one's unsettled imagination, disrupting the stability that the dwellings and their settings establish. This is one of the most effective of the leaves in the way it encourages and confounds comfortable readings. Next. On the tenth and last leaf, the inscribed couplet draws attention away from the mountaintop scene, which is accordingly simpler, with only the barest indications of passage and no marker of destination. It's as if we are now departing, not arriving. A railing at the center bottom, marking the presence of a road, continues briefly across a gap in the overhanging mountaintop mass, leading, leading where? Upward to some unseen higher destination, or leftward around the rocky mass? The pale ink-washed silhouettes of distant peaks draw our eyes, but offer no firm purchase. We are left visually, visually uninformed, deprived of a resolution to this final dreamlike journey into a divine realm. Seen this way, studied at length and in detail, the ten leaves of Xiaomi's album offer 
visual experiences that must, I believe, have been quite new to viewers of the late Ming. How their strange programs fit with Xiaomi's temperament, as we know it from written records, whether any of his other extant works offer similar visionary and unsettling programs, I leave for future researchers to investigate. My own years-long engagement with this remarkable album comes here to a close, as does this lecture. Thank you.